Terry Redgate is my name. I've been an astrological consultant for 26 years now and a researcher studying astrology for about 36 years altogether. Um, I've been researching um, the mind, consciousness, um, and how that links in with astrology. I particularly have a Buddhist bent. I'm really involved in Buddhist psychology uh, rather than Western psychology, which most astrologers work with. Um, I also work with flower essences, which have an amazing impact on consciousness and can really heal at many levels. Um, and I'm also a Reiki teacher, which also fits into the whole process together. <laughs> <I'm not sure. laughs> um, can you describe from your perspective what Okay, in a nutshell, as they say. In a nutshell, That's right. Well, there are two different views on consciousness, really, because uh, which is what I'm coming up against with my research with astrology. Because Western science believes that consciousness comes from the brain, that the brain creates consciousness. Um, the Buddhist uh, Buddhist view, which comes from of a thousand, two and a half thousand years really, and especially with Tibetans, a thousand years of, of meditation processes and deep inner searching. They went inwards rather than outward. They didn't have a telescope, they were inward explorers. Um, they found that actually the brain can be changed by the mind. So through things like meditation, etc., and working with the mind and consciousness and belief patterns, etc., you can rewire the brain. And that the brain doesn't create consciousness, consciousness develops the brain. And there is also um, a whole other level of consciousness that is completely not connected to biology in any way. It doesn't need an actual physical brain to maintain consciousness. And this takes us into areas of rebirth and these sorts of things, which um, the Tibetans have been amazing at, um, in terms of researching this area through their own meditation techniques and also through the death process. It's been quite amazing. So, and that fits in beautifully with astrology, with the way I've been sort of looking at, uh, at the, these sorts of patterns. Yeah, so a consciousness is... Um, there are many different levels of consciousness as well, which is very important for people to understand because we, we operate through different parts of the brain. And if the brain is damaged in any way, of course, then the consciousness that is already there can't come through that part of the brain. So this is why the scientists think, of course, that the brain creates consciousness. But it's just the vehicle. The brain is just the vehicle, like you have a car and you're the driver of the car. And if something happens to the car, you can't drive it, but you're still you. You still have your own consciousness, but the vehicle is damaged. So this is what happens with the brain. So um, with all these different levels of consciousness, we have survival areas of the brain. We have the left brain, logical, rational mind that, that hooks into the five physical senses. We have the right brain that hooks into spiritual reality, an appreciation of art, an appreciation of the spiritual aspects of life. And we also have our belief patterns where up, up in the, the front part of the brain. And of course, the emotional centers in the brain and the limbic system, which are based in the center of the brain as well. So we could operate from any one of those parts of the brain at any particular point in time, and we flip between them all um, quite a lot. And when you're dreaming, of course, at night, you're mostly in the right part of the brain, in that right side of the brain. And a lot of people are very talented in using that part of the brain in their waking state as well. But in school systems, of course, we teach children to work through the left side of the brain. So they're really missing a lot of, of the potential they have with creativity and all sorts of things. So um, the consciousness is a big subject. Consciousness is light. And when a lot of uh, people go into MRI machines, etc., and their, their brains are scanned, or if they're, they're wired up, uh, a lot of them now are getting their brains wired up, and they do this with Tibetan lamas as well. Um, the brain actually lights up with consciousness, with particular thoughts, especially when, um, when they focus on something like compassion. The whole brain lights up. So consciousness is light. It is literally light. And there are scientific aspects to this, like we have neuromelanin um, in the third eye, we have melanin in the heart, and these, these are a phosphorus kind of energies that do light up, literally. So, uh, and some people can see that light, and if we have too much of a left brain consciousness, we lose the ability to actually perceive it, but it is actually there. So um, consciousness is everything. Consciousness is everything. I think consciousness is in everything. And uh, plants have consciousness, and animals have amazing consciousness, and, uh, and birds and bugs have consciousness. So, uh, and as the Dalai Lama says, you know, uh, little creatures will always run away when, when their life is threatened. They have that awareness, you know, that, uh, that they're conscious little beings and we should respect all life. <laughs> and the Western physicists are becoming more, some Western physicists are becoming like Alpha Psi and the Mind Life yeah, Institute. That's right. Um, yeah. Exploring consciousness from a, yeah. um, a more Western perspective. That's right. Yeah, they're, they're starting to look at now what, uh, because Buddhist psychology is, is very rich and has many levels and many schools as well, and they're starting to have dialogues, or well, they've been doing this for 26 years now, dialoguing with the Dalai Lama and what some of their 
the, uh, the geshes, as they're called, they're like doctors of, of divinity. They have uh, like university degrees in that, in that system through that, uh, those old schools and ancient thoughts, which come from Nalanda University way back in, uh, in India, which started, I think, around the 4th century, 3rd or 4th century, um, which came from the original Buddhist teachings of awakening. Um, and this was the whole brain approach. And so a lot of these scientists now are starting to recognize that, yes, maybe there are these other levels of consciousness. And, and there are some things we can't explain that can be explained through looking at things like rebirth and looking at consciousness beyond the physical and the whole idea of cause and effect. And how, um, and from my perspective as an astrologer, when I look at the astrology chart, the astrology chart is, is a result. It's not a cause of something. It's a result of something that happened prior and that person's consciousness is evolved from that chart, but it's because that was the consciousness at the time they were born, which comes from previous causes and conditions. So there's a long stream of consciousness, which now the, the, even quantum physicists are starting to look at. You know, is there chaos theory, or is everything is chaos just something that we don't understand? <laughs> is there actually cause and effect behind the chaos? So these sorts of questions are being asked now. So a lot of uh, physicists, are, and I think also because in in physics and science in the West, we've had a tradition which goes back to the 1500s, where where the Roman Catholic Church proclaimed that scientists could look at anything they wanted to do as long as they didn't touch anything related to um, anything of a religious or spiritual nature. So we had to separate the physical sciences from spirituality and metaphysics and there was a, a very sharp demarcation there and they were not allowed to go into that area. And so it's only just now that science is starting to loosen up and thinking, hey, we're allowed to do this now. You know, we, we can start exploring these other areas. So it's quite interesting. There are big changes afoot, I think. So it's quite promising. And even some of the scientists are starting to do meditation and becoming Buddhists themselves. So, <laughs> Uh, quite impressed with these sort of ideas. And there's um, brain scans, like you say. Yes, that's right. Lighting up. And yeah, I mean, uh, the Matthew, Matthew Ricard, is, um, he's a French, a French Tibetan Buddhist lama, and uh, he's been um, studied many times in many MRI machines. And uh, they say that when he focuses on compassion and meditates on compassion, the gamma rays that his brain emits, is off, they're just off the scale. You know, the scientists say they have never seen anything like this before. It's just his, his, whole, his whole brain lights up, not just a part of it, not just a right brain or a, or a prefrontal cortex, but the whole brain lights up. And uh, it's just extraordinary. And these are levels of mind that are unheard of you know, in, in Western science before this. So it just goes to show if you train your brain in a particular way, you will get particular results. And uh, you can be a master musician or a master artist or, you know, or a master meditator. But whatever it is, you can train the brain to, to work in any way you want. It's completely plastic, <laughs> which is another revelation in science. Because scientists used to think that the brain couldn't be changed after the age of 20. They thought that was it. It was hardwired and that's it. It wouldn't change. And now, of course we keep learning and changing all the time and the brain keeps evolving so no matter what has happened to a brain it can always rewire itself and, and develop new synaptic connections so it's quite wonderful the, the age we live in is quite enlightened I think <laughs> at last <laughs> so um, coming back I, mean, I think you've answered that but um, why is it important and if you can start with the question it is important consciousness is important because well, consciousness um, Consciousness is important because it's the way culture and society evolves. We need consciousness is the thing that, that keeps us together and that keeps um, keeps us in a happy state. Really, if people are very unconscious or not living through consciousness, then they're living like um, like wild animals. In, it would be like a, a you know a kill kill situation. It's like everyone would be wandering around with weapons and looking at everybody else with untrust and distrust. I should say, and all those sorts of things. It would be. It would be a, a horrible society because there are so many human beings on the planet now. We must live together. And everybody is looking for happiness. And happiness comes from consciousness. It doesn't come from ignorance. And if people are ignorant, they never feel happy because they can't, they can't master life. They can't work anything out. And so I remember when I was a little girl, and it must have come from a Buddhist memory of having a lifetime before, I think, of having studied some of these teachings. That I remember thinking to myself about the age of five, if everybody in the world actually focused on doing things for other people, then everyone would have a lot of people doing things for them. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> and then I thought, but if people just do things only for themselves, then they're just totally alone. <laughs> it's like, it's, it was one of those little revelations. I thought, oh, this is wonderful. So the development of consciousness is very important because it moves our culture more towards the spiritual. And I believe that the spiritual is is the real core of who we are. And this is also this also goes back to the, the Buddhist teachings as well, that we all are Buddha nature in essence, which means we all are enlightened, we all are awake. But it's like there are, the sun is always there and the clouds come along and hide the sun. And the clouds 
are like our little ignorant states of mind that, that uh, tend to place too much importance on physical things and on the world being so solid instead of on the spiritual attributes of life and the compassion and the, and the joy and the, and the sharing and these sorts of things. So, so consciousness is very important, um, I think, in, um, in human development and for human happiness, <laughs> is the underlying principle. <laughs> consciousness, children and education. Uh, well, this is a very interesting one because uh, our education system, of course, is really developed along the lines of academia, and it's sort of it, it's an old paradigm of getting people into jobs in order to keep the machinery of society going and economics and these sorts of things. And it it hasn't really always uh, acknowledged the arts and Western culture um, because it, people in Western culture have been evolving and growing. Not everyone has always appreciated the arts as well, but now on mass we're finding more and more people are interested in things like you know, even colour, even look at websites, the change we've seen in websites over the last 10 years, the amazing array of web designers coming through and, uh, and colour and everything's got to be beautiful and beautiful photographs and imagery and people putting their own films up on video on uh, YouTube and these sorts of sites and it's quite amazing. So the education has really blocked a lot of that in the past and people are now, there's a revolution where people are doing it themselves in a way as, as young adults and even as children. But it's starting to evolve a little bit more and I think we have to start training children um, through their whole brain process. We have to teach them left brain and right brain as well as the creative sides and how to transform their emotional nature in that limbic system into creativity and connecting that with the right brain means that they can actually turn anything they experience into something that, that is beautiful and creative. And I think energies need to be transformed, not broken or hidden or buried. Um, if you transform an energy, then it becomes new energy. And the old, the old trauma, whatever it was, disappears because it's become something else. So creativity is very important also in that, in that uh, regard as well. And education, I think it's, um, there are so many new careers now that are opening up that are very creative in the creative areas. And I think this is something also that the education systems in the West have to keep pace with the changes in culture. And this is what we're really missing. You know, they're, they're, they're not, um, they get stuck in the, the academic paradigm. And, and if a child is very intelligent, you know, normally the parents will say, well, would you like to become you know, a doctor or a lawyer? <laughs> they were like the two choices, you know, but, so, but a lot of young people are rebelling against that kind of approach now. And they want, they want a life where they can actually express themselves and not just uh, in a way that can be useful to society. And this is what we have to teach children, I think, not art for art's sake, but art in a way that transforms the world or brings more happiness to people and brings more um, positive culture to society. We need to build a new culture now. So education is important to develop the whole brain of the person. And some children are naturally gifted with right brain energy, some with left brain energies. Some have tremendous wisdom from the, the prefrontal cortex area. Um, some of them have a lot of emotional gifts which they can transform into, into gifts of even healing for other people. So, so um, to actually find that um, what, some, what a child is really good at is very, very important at a very early age. And children will always show you. They always have a natural tendency for something. You know, they'll either always race over and play someone's piano or they'll, they'll want to cook in the kitchen or there's always something. You know, there's something that will tell you uh, what they really love to do. One of the, the big things that creates separation between people when after they've been children, when they become adults, of course, is the belief patterns. When, when someone's belief comes up against someone else's belief, it becomes um, a security pattern. It's a life and death kind of struggle in a way. And, and this is what starts wars and, and conflicts with neighbours and all sorts of crazy things when people have different belief systems. And this is ingrained in children from a very early age because um, the left brain is so logical and rational and likes to order everything. And that's, uh, that's connected up to the, the belief systems. The left brain becomes the belief system. Whatever children are taught becomes the rational way of seeing the world. And the world can be seen in many different ways, many, many different ways. Even across a whole generation of children, they can still see the world in different ways. Of course, uh, Rudolf Steiner was quite amazing in the way he organised um, the, the growth spurts of, of childhood and children through seven-year periods because that fits in perfectly with the astrological um, system of Saturn cycle and Saturn uh, takes 28 to 29 years to do an entire cycle, a circle of the Sun and so every seven years it's going to make a, a 90 degree angle or an opposition or another 90 degree angle to where it was when we were born. So every seven years we get these meetings of the, of the Saturn creating a vibrational frequency with itself. It's, it's the, the angles are like notes on a piano, like uh, notes in music that create harmony or chaos. And these, uh, these seven year cycles are very important because the first one at the age of seven, um, up into the age of seven, children are really living inside that limbic system of the brain and everything around them is symbolic. Everything is a symbolic replay of the past. And so they're, um, they're reacting to life um, 
through past life memory, and that's why their emotions are so deep. So if you take a doll away from a little five-year-old girl and she screams and screams and screams, she's unconsciously remembering someone taking her child away from her. There's an automatic conditioned response pattern that happens with that particular action. So little children are really living in this symbolic world and they're not totally grounded until the age of seven. And Saturn is the planet that relates to things to do with the earth plane and solid matter and rocks and bones and, and the structure of things. And so at that age of seven, they start becoming more grounded into this lifetime and they start developing their own little personalities and they start becoming who they're meant to be in this lifetime rather than living through all those past life sort of personas. And so the age of seven, um, when you see little children at seven or eight, they're really starting to become almost boisterous sometimes. You've got to allow them to develop that little ego. It's just it's a very fragile little part of their development that's just starting to grow. We have to really honour that in a way without them being out of control. <laughs> this way of really honouring that and giving the little children something important to do at the age of seven, which gives them a sense of responsibility. And it, it can be anything like, you know, picking up the, the newspaper off the front doorstep or something every day. Some little job that's just theirs alone that nobody else does. It's just their little job to do. And that gives them that sense of spirit because Saturn is also the planet of spirit. It's a practical spirit manifesting in the world. And so Saturn is, um, Saturn is the part of us that uh, the spiritual quality we have defies the entire Earth's gravitational field every time we stand up. And that takes a lot of a lot of inner spiritual strength to do that. We just take it for granted, really. And when we die, we just fall down, you know, so there's no spirit left. So at the age of seven, they're really starting to develop that inner strength. Then at 14, that, that's the natural age of, of puberty, which is sometimes happening a little earlier now because of the hormones, etc., in our environment, the artificial hormones that have developed through chemicals in the environment. But basically, that's the age with Saturn opposite Saturn, where, where young people start looking at the relationship between self and other. And they're looking at my authority your authority and they're starting to get this sort of balance and they're, they're starting to look at relationship between people a lot more just than just developing their own inner self and their own inner ego they suddenly become aware of other people in that sense um, and the age of um, 21 of course is the age of maturity as we call it you know so that's when people start becoming a lot more their attitude towards life becomes more mature a bit more serious they want to think about making money and the things that they need in life etc and and uh, it's a growing up time and so uh, those, and the Saturn return at the age of around 29 is a very important time when people um, really get, they really become who they were meant to be in this lifetime. They take on more responsibility. Some people get married or some people travel for the first time. Some uh, people have babies for the first time. There's, there's some kind of new responsibility that comes up. A lot of careers change at that age as well. It's a, it's a great opportunity to really uh, develop a completely new life now. You know, from then on for the rest of the life, there's until the next seven second Saturn return, <laughs> sort of at around 50, 56, 57, 58. Yeah, so uh, there's big changes there. So Rudolf Steiner was perfectly in line with the astrological sequences of Saturn's orbit when he was talking about those seven-year periods because they are natural structural periods you can observe in, in young people. And the education system needs to really nurture those and honour those periods as well. And that's what's also missing. There's no sort of spiritual understanding of these sorts of qualities. And Saturn is a very spiritual planet, but it's a very practical spiritual planet. And so the, the whole idea of, um, of educating young people is to nurture the whole person into, and so they can blossom into who they're meant to be, not who the, the, the structure needs them to be, in a sense. And that's also has been missing in education for a lot of young people as well. So that's another thing. <laughs> Thank you. And um, spiritual intelligence? And spiritual intelligence, I think, is, um, I think that's a term you could apply to people who actually can view life beyond the five physical senses because we've all been sort of educated to believe that everything we touch and feel and see and hear is exactly as we think it is and it's all solid matter. But now, of course, quantum physicists and many astrophysicists and various other people are looking at whether or not matter really is matter and perhaps it is all just vibrational frequency which is what they're starting to look at now that um, that when you start looking down inside atoms I mean the atoms are inside your hand but your hand disappears when you look at the, the basic structure of the hand through many microscopes and all the way down you'll find that it's just all vibrational frequency and uh, we have five physical senses which are the ears, the nose and the eyes etc and the skin is the touch which pick up the vibrational energy that emanates from things but this is like the table looks real but actually it, it feels real because we have a field of our hand touching the field of the table and those two fields interact and make it feel solid and the brain actually um, brain creates pictures of how reality is according to our own experiences from from the past and so we all see things a little bit differently not everyone has the same like uh, 
uh, green rods in the eyes, for example, we don't even all see colour the same way. And our appreciation of colour can change and develop as we get older as well, as we develop those spiritual skills. So spiritual intelligence is really a way of perceiving the world also through a lot more compassion and oneness. It's the oneness of everything rather than through the ego, because the lens of the ego separates self from other. And we have no sense of empathy when we do that. There's no sympathy or empathy at all. But through developing spiritual consciousness, um, we can become more aware of other as ourselves. We start recognizing that, that we are all connected. And as Thich Nhat Hanh says, you know, when you look at a piece of paper, it's not just the piece of paper, what you're looking at. You're looking at you know, the tree that created it. You're looking at the sun that nurtured the tree. You're looking at the rain that fell on the tree and the clouds that brought the rain. And in that piece of paper is, is the, the whole universe. When you take it back far enough, there is a connection with everything. It's made of, we're all interdependent. And spiritual consciousness recognizes interdependence. But ego consciousness doesn't. Ego consciousness separates us from everything on the outside of us. And that's what creates a lot of the problems. But, uh, but I think quantum physics is starting to move closer to Buddhist psychology now in terms of recognizing the, the, uh, the non-substantiality of the things we see around us. Nothing is permanent. Everything is, is change and nothing is solid. And if something isn't permanent, it can't be intrinsically real. <laughs> it looks real, but it's not intrinsically real. <laughs> Coming to the idea of touch and Thich Nhat Hanh, um, talking about plastic and environments, why environments for children are very important. Yes. Because they, I believe, can feel that relationship. That's right, exactly. And also because... Can you, talk, can you just put that in your words? Yeah, I think, um, especially with children, they're so tactile as well and so connected to their, to their experiences of the environment that... Objects like plastic, for example, they're just made of long chain molecules so they can bend and be flexible. But they're, they're made from um, petrochemicals and also the substances. They're sort of a mixture of different elements. Or different, if you look at elements like water and fire and earth and, and wood and, um, and air, um, they're a mixture of things, whereas children's toys should really separate the elements. Like wood is wood. They can feel wood. They can feel cotton or wool. They should be able to separate um, the textures of things, and plastic always has the same texture all the time. And it's, it doesn't have, it has a smell that's very, um, it's not a natural smell. It's not a smell that we really recognize with anything through previous incarnations. There's no thread of consciousness there that we can connect it with. And plastics are quite a new kind of an invention as well, um, pr quite apart from all of the environmental concerns, of course. But children are so in tune with those with those elements, you know, they, they can feel all those elements and it's important that they can distinguish between water and, and oil and wood and wool and, you know, they need to, to get to know their world through separate elements. Otherwise, they're just living in a plastic bubble, you know, which is it's a horrible way to live. It's like a prison, you know, so they need, uh, they need experience and this is what makes life so rich when we live in environments that have all these different textures and sounds and, and frequencies. And, and plastic has a bit of the, like the same frequency all the time. It's a dead energy. It has no life force. And even in a piece of wood, it's still alive. You know, it's, it's still there. It still has that life force in it. It still has a degree of consciousness that is there, hidden in the wood. So it's, it's still an important thing. And, uh, and children really resonate with that. They're not, children are not stupid. Because they don't speak English so well, or whatever language is in their culture, People think that they're not intelligent, but their children are amazingly aware, incredibly intelligent, you know, and because their spiritual consciousness is always there, much more so than, than ours is. You know, they have more access to the spiritual consciousness because they haven't had all that left brain training yet. So, so children are very aware of natural things and uh, the natural environment. So when they're, when they're only given one belief system, it creates that belief system then goes from the left brain, rational mind, it gets wired, hardwired into the prefrontal cortex. And that prefrontal cortex is always connected to the reptilian brain, which is survival at the back of the brain. That's the old part of the brain that has the, that keeps the heart pumping and keeps the lungs breathing. You know, when we're sleeping, etc. It's all based on survival. So beliefs then become a life and death issue. And we, when people meet, we grow up and meet someone with another belief system, there's always a clash or a fear. It generates fear. A lot of people are very frightened when they listen to someone else's philosophy if it's not their philosophy, because it, it's a life and death thing. So we have to expose little children, I think, to all kinds of different philosophies, mythologies from around the world, different kinds of religious philosophies, and so that they can actually, um, they can actually view everything in terms of their own past lives that they connect with, because it's all happening on a very unconscious level. It's a very important level, because this is their security. And if someone's, if a little child has come from... Um, say a Muslim environment and suddenly they're taught Christianity and it's really hammered into them there's something in them that knows that something isn't right about this 
you know, and it can create resentment with their teachers. It create, creates confusion in their cultural upbringing. And, and some people can have um, spiritual beliefs that go back to Taoism and ancient times. And, uh, and even some people are, are in tune with Greek mythologies and, and the Greek philosophers. And if they're exposed to that at an early age, then that can nurture their soul. That actually nurtures them all the way through and they can develop a life philosophy based on that and move from that to something else maybe later if they want to in life. But they need to be grounded in something that feels real to them. And so the left brain, the way we teach the left brain um, is so connected to that belief system. They're so sort of um, immediately connected that we're actually imposing ideas that might not even be the right ideas for that child. We're still stuck. The education system still thinks this is the way life is or this is the belief system of our culture. And cultures aren't like that anymore. And the internet has proven that. We're now connected to everyone all over the world. And so we need to appreciate people because um, if we don't honour other belief systems, if we see it as a threat, this is what starts wars, of course. This starts wars and tyranny and fighting neighbours and, and all sorts of things. So if children will grow up in a healthy, happy world if they can actually honour and respect all other cultures and all other belief systems. I think that's really important. And even astrologically, with asteroids, I can see all the different um, cultural belief systems that have been in a, in a child's life in previous lifetimes, whether they've had a lot of Christian lives or Asian lives or Jesuit lives. or You, know, you can really fine-tune that now. And, it's, and they come in with those memories, and they need to work through those memories as they go through life so they can bring out the best of them and also transform some of the more difficult memories associated with those lives. It's part of the game of life. So if they're not exposed to it at an early age, it sets back their development until they're adults. And so all those years are wasted, really. But if they start early, they can, by the time they get to 21, they're ready to fly. 